Um, so again, welcome to everyone who's here for the DC Zine Fest Virtual Summer Zine Celebration. We had way too much fun with me up with that name. Um, I'm Andrea. I'm one of the organizers, and I'll be leading today's uh, panel as a moderator. Um, if you have a question, you can submit them via chat. You can direct message them to me. Um, you can submit them to I have a, I'm going to put that there since for some reason I think Cam has <laughs> was showing up on mine. Um, it, you can submit them via chat or send it as a direct message to me or just do this little raise your hand button. Um, so we're so happy that all of you can join us for research and comics. Uh, and I'm about to introduce our panelists and in, in case you have me looking off screen, I've got three other, two other monitors next to me. So that's why I keep looking back and forth. Um, so first we have Sierra Barnes. Is in, she is a historian turned comic creator who currently lives in DC, making web comics and print comics based on history and folklore. Her current web comic is Hans Vogel is Dead, uh, where a dead Nazi realizes in the afterlife that his actions in our world have greater consequences than he could have imagined. Um, Grace Demaray, I'm hoping I got that since I practiced last night. Uh, Grace self-publishes autobio and middle grade comics and enjoys exploring a variety of genres, including memoir and historical narratives and fantasy with her playful style. Her debut comic was Letters to Vincent about Vincent Van Gogh. Jasmine Pinalis uh, is, writes and draws autobio and fiction work and a quick for, with a quick phrase into research uh, nonfiction. Her latest comic, Deep Writing and Grafting, explores the surgeries related to an autoimmune condition that she um, has and explores that in depth for us. And then Anna Selheim uh, received her MFA from the Center for Cartoon Studies in 2016. Her work primarily focuses on mental health and politics as well, and she's been published in Seven Days the Nib in Our Times Magazine in, and anthologies including Dirty Diamonds, Sweaty Palms, and Comics for Toys. So thank you all for joining us. Um, please remember to check them out as well as our other fantastic tablers on our DC Zine Fest website. Their information is linked both on our uh, panel description as well as, you know, on our website. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our lovely panelists. I was gonna say, I was like, I hope you all can unmute yourselves <laughs> if you needed. Hey, I'm here. So as this is research in comics, the first question I've got for y'all is, what was the first thing you found yourself researching in depth? I know as children, most people have that one thing that they latch onto. For me, it was like, like I'm going to read everything about Greek mythology I can find and get my hands on. So what was that for you? Who wants to go Grace, first? you want to start? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I also know your, one of your answers. <laughs> yeah, so um, I read, I was like really obsessed with um, like general fairy mythology. I went through a big like fairy phase. Um, and then um, lots of like, so I speak two languages and I grew growing up in like a French Canadian home. I like was reading a lot of French children's books and like getting really into that. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Jasmine, how about you? I, as I was thinking about this, I don't have like one thing that I focused on. I was kind of interested in knowing everything I could about anything that crossed my path. So I read a lot of fiction. I would then, if something caught my eye, I'd follow that. I was, I'm really into botany. So I guess maybe botany is one of the few things that I've kind of held on to, to the extent, not so much with doing research, but just being focused. I ended up starting growing a lemon tree in my house in Virginia. <laughs> I've, I'm impressed because I kill all plants. So, uh, Sierra, how about you? Uh, first off, Jasmine, that rules. Um, <laughs> I, I was the mythology kid. I was the hardcore, like, we had that do dollars, do dolor I don't know, the big Greek myth book that everyone had as a kid. And I was obsessed with that. And I had a big gold book on Egyptian mythology, too. And oh, Egyptology? I, I don't Alcima remember what it was with called. The, like, gem on the front? It was, no, it was like oh, okay. a huge, it was like an actual Egyptian book that wasn't like for kids. Oh, hi. <laughs> like, and I remember this distinctly because that's how I learned the word semen. 
it was because it was mentioned in one of the myths and I was like maybe eight and I was like oh yeah that's I don't know what this is but I need to understand this particular set and Horace myth so time to go to the dictionary and uh yeah that was a fun fun time don't sure look that, it up kids if you're in the audience I sh- I'm sure that caused a lot of parental concern yeah um, as- my parents never knew <laughs> <laughs> I had a dictionary. I knew how to use it. Just learning <laughs> dictionary kids. And Anna. Um, I'm trying to think of like the obvious not dark one, but I guess um one of them is dogs. Uh I just I know I don't think I'm very knowledgeable in a lot of things, but I am incredibly knowledgeable of uh just various breeds and facts about breeds and that kind of stuff. Awesome. So in looking at all of your backgrounds, everyone kind of has a very varied background in what their zines and comics and subject matter focuses on. So my question is, when you get an idea, what is your first go-to, like, next step? Um, we can just go in the same order as we did before. Sure. Um, so typically, so my comics are, like, all over the place, um, genre-wise, but I tend to go in two directions. One, like aesthetic research. So like I did a comic about, called Dive most recently about scuba diving. And so I did a lot of like looking at reference photos of like the BCD, you know, the dive vest and making sure that I was drawing it correctly, even though I knew in my head, like I've worn them multiple times, but also wanting to like accurately depict that. Um, and then I also do the like, I guess hard research of actually reading um, and letters to Vincent is a really good example. Like I was reading all of Vincent Van Gogh's letters as like a primary source. Um, I did a comic about Mary Webster, a witch, like an accused witch. Um, And I like really found like a lot of primary sources and other just books on like New England witchcraft. And so kind of my two research direction. Awesome. How about you, Sierra? Um, I sort of do the opposite, actually. I I go with what I call the vibe research, which if I have an idea of like, oh, I'm going to set it in like, if it's historical fantasy or fiction, I will go, you know, it's set in this time period in this world. If it's fantasy, I will say, okay, I want to draw sort of from this general idea and then I start researching concepts. So like I brought some of my, I was grabbing some of my books (laughs) to show everyone. Um, These these ones are actually sort of like later, the ones that I pulled when I was several years into uh, my webcomic, but it's still sort of the idea of what I would go for. One is like, it's it's basically just a textbook on Weimar Germany. Um, and that's to figure out sort of like what would a day-to-day life be and this the other one which I cannot recommend enough is Wasteland by Scott Poole which is about the horror of the history genre Um, and that sort of like gave me a kickstart of associating ideas of like original horror monster movies and like sort of cultural anxieties that were springing up in the 1920s and 30s and how they were expressed through horror movies at the time. And I decided that that was the direction that I wanted to take this comic. So once I sort of like preliminary research is just deciding on a direction. And then once I have that direction, it's, you know, looking through old photographs or looking through other artists that I admire or going on a Wikipedia spiral for four hours in the middle of the night. I love a good Wikipedia spiral. It's how I found out one time how soap was made. Um, Jasmine, how about you? So for me, the books that I've done that have research, I don't have any copies in front of me, so, or else I'd hold them up. Uh, but one was uh, debriding and grafting, so the one about my autoimmune disease. And in 2017, 2016, I did Botanically Speaking, which was a zine of botany facts. So this is all started with information that I knew, and I was just telling people for the botany one, just random facts that I knew, and then I was just like, let me do a book about this. Let me make sure I'm telling the truth, because it's really easy to learn and pick up and hear old wives' tales about things. So I had to make sure that what I was saying was factual, but also interesting that people may not have known about 
And for that one, it was all is mostly fruits and vegetables. So food that we eat. So I had to make sure everything was accurate with that. And then with uh, dividing and grafting, it started, that one was less a research base at first, since it was just going to be me sharing my surgery experience. But then that evolved when I decided I wanted to put out a book. I was just like, well, nobody knows what this disease is. It's relatively rare. And I had to go back and find some research to explain what it was outside of my anecdotal, anecdotal knowledge and to make sure I had factual knowledge. And Anna, how about you? Um, so I guess there's two types of research I do. I guess when it comes to things that are nonfiction or like autobio, uh, I will do research. So for example, I did a comic for the nib at, at one point about, whoops, sorry. Um, about how I was uh, intern for Hillary Clinton back in 2008. And there were like little factoids that I couldn't remember specific like legislative hearings or whatever. So I would have to Google research a little bit on like, what were the actual things we were working on while I was an intern? Um, and then a lot of it also, I, uh, I also do a lot of visual research for so for example the comic i'm working on now is heavily the style is heavily inspired by 1920s like revolutionary woodcuts and so i had to so i'm doing that in the style so for example i'm trying to make the buildings does that read at all mm -hmm. yeah yes. yes okay so yeah i'm trying to make this more of a uh of a revolutionary looking thing but also i'm part of a collective anyone that's in the dc area um i'm part of a collective called square city comics and we get together and do a lot of we do all sorts of things but we make comics together and a lot of our stuff is online now so it's available to everyone in the country but i went with this comic to that group and asked them for help on visual storytelling so a lot of my research was getting ideas from them on ways to visually show like an alternative universe. Um, so asking people and checking in with like other, with other sources, that, that is, um, that is a, that's probably one of my main support uh, sources of, re of research too, is just collaborating and getting critique from other people. Sometimes I wish more authors and artists would do that especially in dc when you read a novel and you're like that's not where that building is and no it does not take 20 minutes <laughs> from the Pentagon to georgetown <laughs> like ncis is so good because it takes place in dc but like they will try to often have alexandria virginia but it's very obviously it's very obviously filmed in nevada near la it's very good or they like, oh yeah, we're gonna go from Quantico to like DC in like thirty minutes. I'm like, That's yeah, exactly right. luck. <laughs> and that actually brings me to like another question I have, which is, I know, I, I mean, I am not as I, I, I technically am a zinester, I guess, but I'm not a comic book person. I'm not a, in terms of like writing and whatnot. But I do find myself when I write fan fiction, especially if it's in a historical setting or of a certain era or aesthetic, I find myself hung up on the most mundane or just like tedious of details. And so my question is like, what are the details you find yourself fixated on when it comes to either a certain time period, a certain historical thing? I believe when we were talking, it was like the pants and skirts that someone wears in the 1940s and like then you wind up in the rabbit hole of well I've got to find out what bloomers look like <laughs> um I find myself like particularly so I feel like two things one like costuming is totally one of those and we, we were talking about this yesterday but like costuming I will get like and I even talked about this in like my dive comic right like I have to, I want to make sure that like the BCD I'm wearing is correct or on like the octopus is on the right side or like with a dress, if it's like the fifties, how is that cut? Um, and then also I like re when I'm doing auto bio stuff, I re it's really important to me like to capture the essence of a moment, if that makes sense. And, th and that's like super abstract, but like, um, being able to be like, I know exactly what that person said to the, like, 
and I know exactly how I want to like draw this scene um, is really important to convey like an emote, like I want the reader to instantly feel a sense of like awe or um, anxiety with my comic spoons about like chronic illness. I did like, I was, as I was drawing that comic, I was taking notes in the doctor's office of like exactly what the doctor was saying. Um, so I feel like essence of something, which is abstract and then the more like clothing and costuming is really something that I'm obsessed with. <laughs> awesome. Sierra, how about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I find that like there's, it's a balance between um, sort of, especially with things like historical fantasy, which sort of blur the lines, which is the genre that I like most like to get into. Um, you want to evoke a specific feeling. And I personally find that like researching with the idea of evoking that feeling is uh, tricky because there's sort of on the one hand, you are working with an audience that has developed a lot of shorthands that are not necessarily accurate. So if you like, you run into the Tiffany problem all the time, which is where sometimes things that are true are not believable. Um, like Tiffany is the, the example that I come up with a lot because it was, uh, if I named a character in a novel about the Byzantines, Tiffany, people would come after me saying, that is an inaccurate name. Why would you name a character that? But Tiffany was actually quite a common name in the Byzantine era. It was short for uh, Theo, of course, now it's gonna escape my mind. But there are things like nipple piercings were extremely popular among Napoleonic soldiers. But if I write a Napoleonic soldier with a nipple piercing, you know, like- That's people hot. Are like, that, yeah, that's my cake. <laughs> yeah. First of all, you're brave and you should say it. Um, <laughs> second of all, you know, there will be people who are like, that is taking me out. Like, this is taking me out of the Napoleonic era. So you want to, like, on the one hand, I, I tend to be very, like, I get into the weeds of physical objects a lot of times. Like, the last two pages of my webcomic, I was on a rabbit hole hunt for a specific rifle used in 1811 by Prussian troops that would have made it its way down to Austria. And like, this is a fairy tale world. I didn't have to do that. But for me, it was important. And whoever recognizes that particular 17 inch barrel, 1811 edition of that Prussian gun, you and me can be friends. I love okay. you. <laughs> I'm doing this for you. But for everyone else, you know, just like, I know, yeah, a rifle in 1811, 17 inch barrel. It was insane. It's like a little short baby gun. Um, but read my comic. <laughs> ridiculously specific, specific guns. But yeah, I do, I do the getting caught in the weeds thing for me. Um, I'm sure that there are like two or three people who are just as obsessed as I am with the objects or the other one, the big one is clothing. Mm -hmm. As uh, the Tiffany me. problem reminds me of in my head, I'm like, I'm not picking a bunch of 80s mall rats, but in the Byzantine empire. That's my and next I know that is <laughs> Please, please. Yeah, stay uh, tuned. Actually, my next comic is about lesbian Mongols, so stay tuned for that. Hi. Um, I was gonna say I'll plug the my one of my favorites is called uh, Anthologies is Dates. It's all about queer historical fiction, but the caveat is you have to have a happy ending, and it's delightful. Oh hell okay. yeah, that sounds adorable. They are. They're really good. They're like three uh, anthologies as of now. So, Jasmine, yeah. how about you? What are the details you find yourself? So when I'm Getting started with a story, I end up thinking too big and trying to figure out and plan everything. So in a way, the harder thing is to rein in the world building and to actually just write the story and to have the characters do things. Like I've got this story world that I've known of and I've been planning for about five years at this point, I think, uh, that is very lazily currently titled Lady Knight and Prince. And at its core, it's about this knight who ends up saving a prince who got put in a tower by his king father who sucks. So in my mind, the story is three main parts, the knight story and how she became a knight, the prince's story and kind of some of his life while he's in the tower and how he got to the tower. And the third part is like their journey and their experience together. And just in planning everything since it's 
uh, kind of like a historical fantasy, I've been thinking, okay, so now what does the world look like? What does this look like? How does this work? What type of animals do they have? And it's kind of, I just need to remind myself, all of that is great. The scenery is great. The scenery is important. But I need to have these characters get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what type of cake these people would be eating? Does it matter if this knight is on a hike through the woods? (laughs) I think that's a great point considering a lot of times when people think of getting bogged down they think of like the minutia and the details and not so necessarily like oh my god it's the macro level problems of like this is everything I need to make like Hobbiton was probably not built in a day even though sometimes by reading Lord of the Rings as we talked about yesterday it feels like he decided to write everything as a day by day. (laughs) So Anna how about you? Um, I don't know if there's a lot of things I get really it depends on the, so I'm a short form cartoonist. I have a lot of different, so this narrative I'm working on now is 30 pages, which I think is the longest cohesive narrative I've ever written. Um, that being said, I will say a lot of, with the bog down stuff, comics, and I'm assuming, and art in general, I think is about good enough versus perfect. Mm. And so being able to get yourself to pull yourself out of those rabbit holes is really important. Um, there is, a there is a cartoonist named Iron, uh, I'm sorry, Spike Trotman, who's, uh, the founder of Iron Circus, and she talks about on a podcast she does called Dirty Old Lady, where she will see some character design where, uh, someone online, and they will be so meticulously detailed, and the description for Iron Circus, or the description for the character design is pages long and you know spikes spike says that thing's never getting made you're just too deep down a rabbit hole it none of this is relevant to anybody but you so i personally have a universe like that in my head but i know i'll never get it down to paper um but for example something that bogged me down recently actually wasn't a zine that was made but i published an online article with on Solrad, which was um also known as field mouse press about uh, problematic Instagram mental health comics. And unfortunately, so I had to go down an insane rabbit hole to find all these examples of the bullshit mental health comics I was talking about on Instagram. And unfortunately, like I discovered that Explore tab and <laughs> it's hate reading that stuff. It's, it's ruined me. I go there all the time now just to see what's going on. <laughs> Like that, it is such a time waster. I will have so much I want to do. And then all of a sudden I've been on Instagram for two hours, just looking at bad. Anyway, so that's the kind of stuff I do. <laughs> I guess. Is there fan- can read this article? I know uh, in, in fan realms, you always talk about, uh, sorry for the cursing, hate fucking, but hate reading is very real. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've hated yeah, so the, many um, books. The article, the article is on my blog. Uh, which is somewhere on my website. <laughs> and you can find her website if you click on the description for this panel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, some actually rapid fire-ish questions for y'all. So since this is in research in comics, uh, I'm going to ask a few areas in which, you know, if you're looking for this kind of thing, what are your go-to uh, places to look? Um, I When we were in uh, one of the earlier panels, I found something called Crap Hound, and I was like, well, I'm going to go buy a bunch of these now. Um, and it's these things of, you know, wanting to give people some resources of where to go. So if you're looking for things like uh, aesthetic, structure, design, like you were talking about faction, architecture, where's your, is it going to be the internet? Is it going to be the library? Is it going to be scrolling through Instagram Explore? <laughs> oh my gosh, I have this really unhealthy, like Anna, literally what you were talking about, my unhealthy relationship with Pinterest is like disgusting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, like, my Pinterest boards are out of control, um, like, and as much as it is a time suck, it's also really great to be, like, uh, I re- you can look up, like, women sitting in group illustration, question mark, into Pinterest and get, like, weird, great reference photos, stock image research I do a lot of, like, Adobe stock and um, for like poses and stuff. 
There's also um, a, I use um, an, a book, I think it's like an art model something, and it has like just, it's a photo, it's just a bunch of nude, nude photos that are of like really classical poses. Um, and I also use um, a really great thing when you're stuck is um, Ivan Brunetti's Cartoonist book. It's just a bunch of small exercises that can really help me get out of that like bogged down narrative space where I like have so many big ideas and I like am having a really hard time articulating that. Um, those are just a couple. Um, I mean, we can do this popcorn style, so whoever has something to chime in can, because it might not be applicable to everyone, so I don't want to necessarily go in order. Um, so, I was going to say, for me, it kind of just depends. So with my Lady Night in Prince story, a year or so ago, I sat down in the Fairfax Library because I just happened to be in Fairfax. I live in Ruston. At that time, I lived in Ruston. I was in Fairfax that day. And... I sat down and it's just like, okay, I'm going to look at all these fashion books to get some better ideas to restructure the clothing that I'm putting these characters in and to get better ideas for weaponry because off the top of my head, I draw very boring swords. All of us draw very boring swords. We all draw like a little pop gun as a gun. So looking up things like that, I was just like, okay, let me pull a couple of these books for right now. Let me do some quick sketches to get a, a better idea as to how I can improve so then when I go back to the cartoons, I'm like, okay, this is what an elaborate version looks like. Here's going to be the simplified version. But I needed the seeds so I could make what I was going to make up better. So sometimes it's books. Uh, for the botany stuff, I was trying to find uh, more journals or websites done by botany biologists. Not just botany, but uh, about biologists from universities to make sure that the facts are saying that we're actual. Um, oh, Sierra? Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, um, for, for those of us in quarantine hell, which is everyone, uh -huh, <laughs> the Wikipedia spiral is my, like, my general first, absolute first start. Um, and what you do is you go and you look up on Wikipedia, whatever you're going to do. Yeah, I'm getting there. The, whoever said museums. If you scroll down to the bottom, <laughs> academic hack, if you scroll down to the bottom of Wikipedia, they have all the sources. So you just go and you pull all the sources and then you take those and you use those because usually that is a great spot for a bunch of consolidated other information. And the other thing is if you speak any other languages, looking up Wikipedia articles in other languages will also get you other language sources, especially if you're looking up something that is specific to the language. So if I'm looking up something like, you know, Faustus, on the English language page, that will get me some results, but then I go, do, 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 okay, I speak German, I'm going to hit the German version, and suddenly I'm looking at Faust, and then it's a whole other list of sources to go through, so a lot of them will include things like museums, and a whole lot of museums have a bunch of, like, online specials right now, where you can take virtual tours, or that they have virtual logs of all of their um, exhibits and stuff, so, like, going through and looking through all of the pretties, on display around the world right now is super cool. There's a great exhibit and I think the National Portrait Gallery by Hawkseye that I am dying because I didn't get to see it in person in January when life was open. <laughs> Cries in Spanish. Um, but I believe you can still look it up online and I highly recommend if you're just looking for some inspiration you can go there. I also just have like three or four favorite artists that I like put up as like posters. You know, the scene in The Good Place where Jason is like leaning against the poster and he's like, oh, we're in it now. That's just me, but putting in like three or four different artists. Oh, Yvonne Bilibin, we're really in it now. So, um, I would recommend, I mean, I go on the internet for the vast majority of my stuff. The other thing I do is if I have a friend that has an area of expertise or I have a quality based on one of my friends, I will go to them and ask them specifically what would work for a character. So for example, if you go to my website, there's a comic called Safe. Um, and it's one of the characters is a Thai immigrant 
and I needed a I needed a song that would be good to sing in karaoke that also uh, this this Thai immigrant character would not necessarily be super familiar with. And my friend Sandy, who is also a Thai immigrant, um, I went to her and she loves karaoke. So I asked her, I asked her specifically what would work for that. Or I use astrology a lot, but I don't know anything about astrology. So I've got my my specific friend that I asked astrology information for. Um, or if I'm looking for a photo reference, I have friends that you know, have better resources than I do. I ask my boyfriend a lot of times for like male fashion, like old school male fashion resources. Um, but then most of my stuff is just internet searches. Yeah, just a lot of random internet searches. I don't love random internet searches. Um, since a lot of you, some of you do historical things, some of you do contemporary things, some of you do personal things. And one of the questions I had was, how do you make choices between design and color? So are you doing black and white? Are you doing things in tones? Are there particular colors you, you know, lead with, leave out, anything like that? For me, uh, since I prefer to work traditionally and my intended uh, display for my work is usually traditional, it depends on how I'm going to print it since so far most of my books have been printed by myself or I've paid for it and then I'm just trying to recoup my losses so I just paid for it twice pretty much. I end up doing a lot of things in black and white so even uh, botanically speaking it had a full color cover because color covers are affordable but then the interiors are black and white so I ended up just making sure I had really nice grayscale inks and I actually had good contrast, which was something I, I used to struggle with because it's really easy when you're doing grayscale, you're kind of just like really close on the paper, like, ah, oh, this is great. And then you back up and you're like, this is all the same tone. So it, for me, it kind of just depends on how, how it's going to be finished and how others are going to see it or anything that I end up printing. So it's a lot of uh, black and white work so I can afford to print it. Color is pricey. Color is pricey, and also someone who's partially colorblind, sometimes when it's grayscale, I'm like, ah, yes, that is all black and white. <laughs> <laughs> I use a lot of, um, like, color is one of my favorite things to work with in general, um, and I, uh, I look at a lot of, um, like, nature photography and pull from, like, oh, wow, I love this really rich, like, saturated pink of this particular kind of fish. Or, um, like, the difference between the blue of the Atlantic Ocean versus the Red Sea. Or, like, um, just, like, in the like, how our environment influences our color choices. I, like, I'm constantly, like, wow. New York has a very particular kind of gray that's different from the DC gray. Um, so I, I think a lot about those kind of nuanced color changes. Um, and I work in, when I'm working traditionally, I always have like a big sheet of scrap paper next to me that I'm like dabbing with like this comic marker. Ooh, I don't really like that color. And sometimes I'll develop like a little color wheel right on a scrap sheet of paper. And then I'll like paste that at the top of my drawing table as like, these are the five principal colors that I'm going to use for this book. And those are going to ground the rest of my work. I don't know if Sierra or Anna wanted to chime in. Uh, yeah, I'm, I am a, a self-taught artist to whom color theory is strange and foreign, and we are working on it. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, color is like my worst enemy a little bit. I'm very afraid of it. I also started this comic five years ago before I had any training and just sort of was like, you know what, I'm going to do the first chapter in sepia and then the rest of it is going to be in full color and that's it, baby. It's web comics. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> the world is my oyster. I'm going mad with power. And of course now 260 pages later and finishing the first volume, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to look up printing it. And like, I chose a weird size for pages and I have full color now. So like, 
Gigi and myself. <laughs> uh, don't do that. Start with black and white. Don't be like me, kids. Um, I'm still very much working on things like pa having a palette. <laughs> and what is a color scheme? And they tell you things when you're in kindergarten that's like, these are the three primary colors. And you're like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. And then like 12 years later, they're like, oh, by the way, this mean things in art. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's nice. That's, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Excellent. As someone who has woken their partner up to make them check that their outfit matches before going off to like work, I feel the color theory thing. I'm like, yeah, someone told me that this matches once, so like I'm gonna take it and run with it. But other <laughs> yeah, than somebody, that, somebody told me green and orange are complementary, but I don't know what that like. Sure, all right. <laughs> I am from Miami, Florida. It's green and so red, I'm, I think. Uh, yeah, Miami, see, Florida, so yeah, on good authority, yeah, okay. yes, green and orange do apparently match. Well, I mean, in a way, though, green is interesting because it's plants, and then, like, flowers always look great. I mean, unless it's, like, a specifically ugly flower. Yeah. So anything with green, half the time it works, unless it's something that's, like, the shade that is just going to look like garbage, in part because, like, you look at flowers, like, you see orange flowers, like, that's awesome. You see red flowers, you know, with the green leaves and everything, like, that looks fantastic. You go outside in that weird season of fall when like half the trees are green, half the trees are yellow. Like, this looks amazing. How? I, whenever I think about colors, um, and this came specifically when I was doing my wedding color palette. Yes, very thrilling. My mom was like, you can't have more than three colors. I'm like, have you ever seen an Indian or Pakistani wedding? It's like, here are all the colors. Please use them and put them to your heart's content. And I was like, yeah. so that's where I took it and ran with it. And then Anna, I didn't know if you wanted to chime in on this. Oh, uh, sure. For me, it depends on the project. Um, mm -hmm. If there's a time crunch, I will uh, not do color. The last zine I did uh, was a dream zine where it was just me um, experimenting with different styles uh, and art styles and mediums. And so because it's com almost completely art based, uh, it is going to be in color. And but for example, I've got, the one I'm working on is I'm on a time crunch, so that's not gonna happen. My Everything's Fine series, uh, which is my mental health autobio series, um, that is in all in color because uh, it's all abstract avatars. So for me, it just personally depends on the project. I am also in my mind, like personally, aesthetically, I would love to use every color of the rainbow all the time. But after getting feedback from other people, the limited color palette thing is actually, people seem to really prefer it. Um, with the Everything's Fine series, each strip is its own color palette, but doing up, doing more than four colors, as good as it looks to me, kind of boggles everybody else's mind, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it's like one of those personal preference things, which is, hard when you're then making a medium that is meant for other people to look at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so one more question, I guess, before we get into some of the questions we've gotten from attendees. So with things like history, personal zines, and things that are research heavy, what is it that you think makes a comic or a zine perhaps a better medium for these kinds of work versus, uh, you know, something written or even something completely visual like a television series or movie or uh, art house film that you walk away while you're like, what the heck was that? Because um, heavy information and sequential art itself is um, relatively new, I guess, to more people reading it um, with large historical graphic novels that you now see in classrooms, whereas before you didn't necessarily see that. I, for me, I like the ability of show, not tell, because you can show things, you can show a specific perspective, you can show a certain element, a certain vibe that doesn't work out as well sometimes when something is all just prose. But then because it's not uh, like a movie or television show, you as the audience or I as the audience can take as much time as I want to look over this page. I want to look at the detail. I kind of want to think, why is this perspective being used? It's like I mentioned uh, when we were uh, chatting last night, I was bored out of my mind reading Night, but I just latched onto reading Mouse. And I think just taking it and separating it from reality in a sense, just 
made it something different that I could latch onto that could stick with me. So because it was kind of just like a shift in expectations and I had more control over it in a different way or I just had different control, it just worked out better for me. So that's one thing that I like with comics is how you can just show things in a different way since it's not wholly hinged on words. It's the visuals and the fact that symbols mean things. And there's teaching somebody these symbols and teaching somebody the language of comics or the language of your comic. And then them coming to it with their own understanding and how that's a different type of conversation. I have always been a visual like thinker. Like when I'm coming up with an idea, words tend to come in like these small bursts. And whereas images, I all get like, this visual moment that I, it's much easier to, for me to articulate while drawing. And then after I draw a scene, I'll go back in and be like, oh, this is the text that I think really fits. I've also, I also struggle with like just reading, my reading skills in general, or like my writing skills. I'm, because I'm dyslexic, I'm an awful speller. And like, I'm always giving my fiance my stuff to read and editors my stuff to read. So um, I think when I have an idea, comics provide me this like perfect compromise of wor the like words that I can bring in, I can choose to bring in words, but I can also choose to leave them out and still like someone will be able to understand um, and vice versa, right? Like I can have, I can have a prose sentence that or like a page where it's like black with just text um or like a really simple in my comic tubes i i say my body is a tangled mess talking about um this surgery that i had due to a chronic illness and i just like this swiggly line and then text on a blue background and that like i think really packs a punch in a different way um so i i just think that I've always kind of, my brain has always thought in kind of a comics medium ever since I was a little kid. And then when I figured out that I could do that, I'm like, oh, obviously, like, this is my, this is my language. I love it when you figure out you can actually do the thing you like as a job. <laughs> Still figuring that out. <laughs> uh, I wish I, I could like arguing to figure that out. Yeah, I, I don't know. I like arguing became a lawyer. Don't actually ever become a lawyer. You're good at arguing at something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Anna or Sierra? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that like sort of bouncing off the ideas that have already been said, um, I think that comics have sort of a strength in that you are you are literally using different parts of your brain to read a comic. So even when a comic has a page that is only pictures or only texts, you are still reading it as though you are reading both things at the same time. And I think that you're able to present frankly, a lot more information than you would be from just one or the other. And I think that another sort of emotional uh, difference that reading comics has than, say, watching a movie is that a movie holds you hostage in terms of time. You, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> literally, like, you have you are going to finish Paul Blart Mall Cop. You <laughs> are, it's the last thing I do. We're going to finish Paul Blart Mall Cop on my time. Like, a one second equals one second in a movie. It is holding you hostage. But in a comic, one second can take as much time as you need to read it. Comics, movies hold you hostage, comics set you free. That's it. Sierra Barnes points. <laughs> but, I don't um, I'm going to yeah. let you guys in that some of the like, moder uh, organizers have been collecting quotes from all these panels and being like, yes, <laughs> buttons, stickers, <laughs> quotes. I'm pretty well, just hold you hostage. hostage. Comics I'm, set you free. Yeah, I may be paraphrasing that from somebody. If I am, I apologize. I've forgotten. This is why you should keep a bibliography, kids. That's um, your new campaign poster. Movies hold you hostage. Read comics. Comics set you free. Yeah. But like literally, when you're, when both, both you're consuming and you're creating comics, time is something that you have freedom about and you can sort of guide the reader along by having you know shorter panels or having less panels on a page or more panels on a page or more dialogue or less dialogue but ultimately the reader gets to decide at which pace they consume the comic 
and how many details they look for and how many details they skip over. Um, and I think that that has a lot of opportunities for both like using comics as research or when you're researching for comics, deciding where you want to put your focus. Anna? I think kind of everybody else nailed it. I, I, the, I guess the only thing I would add um, is that I think you can do a wider variety of visuals in comics and then I think the uh, wider variety of visuals than probably any other medium, like even movies, I think cartoons you can probably get away with. Cartoons are similar in the fact that you can pretty much create any visual as well, but I think comics are unique in the, in the way that you can have words interact with images um, that if you're doing a live action movie of any kind, a non-animated movie or a prose book, um, you just can't have the same variety of format. But yeah. yeah. Well, it's, I, know, I, was just gonna, I was just thinking about the, something I would mentioned earlier about like the discussion of audience and creator. And also what we've all said about how comics are really strong and different visually. There's this movie that came out in the early 2000s called The Fall, directed by Tarsim Singh and yeah. starring Lee Pace. I don't, so it's, that movie's the best. There's, I just heard so, Lee Pace but, and I'm just thinking about great eyebrows, continue. Yes, He's fantastic wonderful. eyebrows. He's but wonderful. no, The Fall is fantastic because it's this adult telling a story to a child, but then the visuals of the movie are the child's imagination. The adult says Indian and thinks Native American. The child knows Indians as India Indians. So having that discussion, that movie is like the best example of the conversation that stories are. I think comics fall into an interesting location in that discussion because as the author, you're giving certain things, like I was saying, the, the symbols and the language, but then the reader is still coming to that with their own language and their own understanding of the same symbols. I think that's a great, I mean, point. And that, you know, what is the, the things that you can see and the things that you can interpret are much vastly different. And it's, uh, is that Watchmen, Nick? Yeah. Just speaking about movies whose comic book adaptation, whose uh, adaptations did not live up to the original. <laughs> Sorry, look, I know Alan Moore is like the problematic Santa Claus in my comic book shelf, but like, I mean, the man writes a good bibliography. I can't fault him for that. Um, so we did have one question from the audience. Um, so do any of you have suggestions for organizing large anthology research comic projects, like a software that you use for organizing a reference, uh, something like Evernote, make sense of spreadsheets? Um, or just a scatter I of notes that like uh, Always Sunny from Philadelphia? <laughs> I um I do all of my layout stuff in InDesign and have become very like InDesign literate. Um the Adobe Suite is a really clunky or not clunky but complicated program. Um but once you kind of get InDesign it, it like I I felt like personally it opened up a lot of doors. Um and email, keep track of your email. I've been like in so many anthologies where like, I'll like miss an email and I'll be like, wait, what? That was like a size thing. Like one lost email can really um, <laughs> screw you if you if you like aren't careful. Anyone else have any suggestions at our last? I know there was a few in the chat uh when the question originally popped up um for me i will say that if i'm looking up visual things on the internet to keep track of my images are extremely clearly labeled and my desktop is incredibly organized so is my google drive so that everything is easily accessible right like everything is alphabetized um and yeah so that's, if you can just keep all of your resources neatly organized, I think that helps a lot, especially with the visual stuff. Yeah, Google Drive for sure. Yep. People with organized desktops are powerful and I fear them. 
Um, <laughs> mad respect to you guys. Uh, My main folder is called the pit of despair. Yeah, yeah. And then you go in and everything unravels perfectly in lovely little folders. Oh, oh. I, I was, Sierra, I, I'm not sure if that notebook, but it reminded me that if I have a major project, I will create a specific notebook just for that project. Mm -hmm. That is a technique I do see a lot of people using. I'm a big proponent of uh, spreadsheets. I run a Twitter account that goes rereading the Harry Potter books, but pairing it to wizard rock music, which is its own weird genre. And the amount of uh, things of filters and spreadsheets I have for keeping that, I'm always a good spreadsheet proponent. Yeah, um, old I think we're at, I mean, honestly, there, that's a good commonplace book is always handy. Um, I want, uh, so I think that's actually it for us. So if everyone wants to join me in thanking our panelists for sharing their wisdom. That'd be great. Silent claps on the Zoom. And um, so thanks everyone for coming to this panel. You can check out all of our panelists on the panelist description as well as, as our tablers on there. And there are many more tablers to go see. Um, and stay tuned for our next panel, which will be starting in 10 minutes.